everyone who listens to the station here at DFW. And this man is driving through from California. Never <laughs> listened before. Heard people saying, hey, this is why this station is important to me. And he gave. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, how crazy is that to that quickly recognize the value? Yeah. But uh, it's it's the message of grace. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonates with everybody. Thank you so much for giving out of California as you pass through. Thank you so much to Alice out of Arlington All right, Alice. for your gift of $50. That's how it happens. She was the line leader. Alice is saying, come on in. It was easy. Yeah. And I feel a little differently now that I've given. We just heard from Alice. We'd love to hear from um, uh, Mel. Are you just throwing out names? No, it's Alice's at oh, the restaurant. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've heard about that Flo show. Yes, and yes. Bo, you know what she used to say back in the day. Um, this is a, an H check, obviously, right. <laughs> during no, the no. lunch break here. <laughs> no, I really enjoyed your show. I know you I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Alice. Yes, Alice yes. was great. Come on now. We're the grits. If your name's Laverne or Shirley, oh, I'd love to hear from you Should as be well. Shamazel. Or Rhoda. Rhoda. How many Rotas are there, you think, listening right now? There's got to be one. Come on, let's move on up with George in Wheezy. There you go, yes. George. Oh, my goodness. We are taking a little <laughs> scroll down memory lane, and this is what you do when you get to be sunny at my age. Yeah. You kind of forget what you're doing. And you're like, hey, do you remember that show from the 70s? I loved that show. Yes, I do. Yes, if your name is Bo or Luke, you definitely need to call. There you you know there's a Bo or Luke here in come Texas. Come on, Daisy. Right, come on. Let's do this. So, Alice led the way. Let's hear from you, whether you've heard your name called out from a 70s sitcom or not, or 70s drama. What would you call the Dukes of Hazzard? Was that a... It's 70s, yeah. I know it's 70s, yeah. but was it a, not really a drama? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Whatever it was, it and was fun. Sunny and Cher. Here's very popular show. That's very true. Yes. Hey. So whether you... I got you, baby. Whether you exit your car door by <laughs> opening it or you just run up and you jump right into it and you say yeehaw and you drive off and you jump over the tracks, yeah. hey, we want to hear from you. Here is your number to call right now, 888-886-8848. You can go to kcbi.org. One on the line. Will you take line two right now? 888 886-8848. There is a need with nine minutes to go of... 1,900... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, $1,450. 1,450. So, the one on the line, we don't know how much you're giving. So, if you jump in with your gift of, say, $500, or yeah. maybe you can do 34 a month, and yeah. a lot of people do that, that's going to go so far in meeting this half-hour goal. Here is your number to call right now. 888-886-8848. You can go to kcbi.org. You can give in the app or call right now. 34 a month,
like you said, this it wasn't you know the great suggestion. It was a great commission. It it it's you know it's a commandment that he gave, and somehow in the church we adopted an idea that it's that it's optional. And so when he spent three and a half years modeling in his life, he was modeling for his disciples what he gave the, the command at the very beginning. He said, I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. And, and being a fisher of men is another way of saying, go and make a disciple, go make more fishers of men. And so when we look at his life, we see that he modeled and laid out a very clear, intentional process for his disciples. And you've written a book that's called Intentional, Living Out the Eight Principles of Disciple Making. It's uh, available now. And uh, in, in terms of intentionality, um, talk about the power of that. But first of all, what what is a non-intentional? What is a, a church that's non-intentional about disciple making or, or non-intentional in disciple making? What does it even look like? Yeah, I think it. You know, if we're going non-intentional, that then that means we're kind of hoping that something something happens accidentally. Um, that you know that there's maybe a chance that it'll occur. That's not what Jesus modeled. That's not what the New Testament gives to us. It's a very intentional, purposeful um, effort, and and that's why in my book I talk about that being a disciple maker has to become who we are, not just something that we do. And in church, especially in America today, we have become a bunch of doers that are just, let's do church, let's do Sunday morning, let's do these programs. And when we look at the early church and what Jesus did, no, it was a lifestyle that they lived with an incredible amount of intentionality behind it. And so I think there's a big difference when we look at the life of Christ and how the early church uh, modeled and, and gives to us in the scriptures versus what we're doing today, which is a very activity based, very focused on a Sunday morning program. And we're missing the intentionality that Jesus gave and modeled in making disciples. You guys have been doing this for decades and the Lord has worked through you to make discipleship the focus. And I don't think I was three three times at real life when I was just began attending. Um, it was, I think, probably three times before I knew Share Connect Minister Disciple. Uh, and I happened to come in at a period where, where the staff was preaching this, share with people, connect with people, minister, disciple. And it's been, for me, a short time compared to you, but I found myself the other day trying to get an older gentleman to open up to me over a period of weeks, um, trying to disciple this guy. And I'm really trying to minister to him. And finally, I sat down and I presented to him a really scary scenario that had gone on in my life and recently and asked, you know, explained it to him and asked him for prayer. He said, well, let's pray right now. And Brandon, the next time I saw him, he was completely open about his life. And I realized I missed a step. Mm -hmm. I I shared conversation, but I I didn't share myself. I didn't sit down and share myself. So talk about what you think is in terms of being intentional what's the what's the hardest thing and then what's the easiest thing for most people the hardest and the easiest yeah the hardest part about being intentional is it, it's a learned practice like we to, to be able to be intentional with our lives like it, it has to become to get to this place to where it's i use the example it's like breathing we we make a disciple without thinking about it and and getting to that big repetition in practice. And I think the hardest thing for the, the church, really the Western church, is that's not something we've practiced. It's not something we've done. And so the idea of, wait, I thought discipleship was just sitting in a classroom and learning some Bible education. What you're describing in your scenario, it's a it's a lifestyle that you're living where you're having these conversations and you're living it out where you even went back and reflected like, hey, I missed a part. Like you're talking about a lifestyle and the hardest thing that I've run across in 20 years of doing this with the church is we're so ingrained in a Western model of church that is just kind of, again, focused on these certain things. Classrooms aren't bad. Education isn't bad. We need to learn and grow. But I think the hardest part is getting over this issue of church just kind of being a programmatic thing that we do, not something that we are. Yeah. I think that, I think your other question, the easiest part that's been for me is when I when I surrender and do this, this is what the Holy Spirit wants. 
the Holy Spirit wants his people accomplishing the Great Commission, glorifying Jesus Christ, and seeing the kingdom advance. And so I'm willing to set some of my own agendas, my own programmatic thinking, some of the old habits down, and start pursuing Jesus' way of disciple-making. Uh, suddenly the whole, whole new world comes alive. And that's what, I'm, that's what I write about in the book, is, is, man, if we can do this, the church can do this and that starts changing people around us it starts changing how the church impacts the world around us yeah it does and, and uh, the book is called intentional living out the eight principles of disciple making brendan Brendan Gwinden, um author bobby harrington you've uh, also heard of writes a forward to this so i find myself now uh unintentionally speaking the word of the lord and in the strangest areas, you know, uh, we make a very, very strong uh, rule that we don't go men ministering to women and women ministering to men. We, we try to keep those roles really clean. And I want you to know I have this ritual you're aware of. Some of your guys have been to me with, uh, been with me on this after I go, you know, do an insane amount of exercise and get 3,800 3, calories in the hole. I go eat a bunch of pizza and salad. You probably have people come back and get sick. Right, and it is gross. I think it's probably sinful. And, and I was at that pizza place, and a young woman said to me, um, uh, it was we were talking um, just around things. She said, well, if I go to heaven, I guess I'll figure that out. Mm. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to wow. me? I said, why is it if? Well, I said, what? Why is it if? She goes, well, I mean, if. I go, yeah, but what are the steps? She goes, oh my gosh. Uh, well, I, I see, I watch church online, right? Um, oh, be baptized. Very good. Very good. What are some other things? We'll do what Jesus says, yes. And then she said, I said, I think you might be forgetting one, which is repent. And she looked yeah. at me, Brandon, and she looked at me, she said, you're going to bug me about Mary and Jake again, aren't you? <laughs> I said, I didn't say a word about you getting married to your boyfriend. I think he's a great guy. Uh, but she goes, oh, my gosh, but I'm I'm sinning. I go, that's up to you. Brandon, that happens because I spent time in your program. That happened because Jim Putman um, putting me in his discipleship group. So what is something that a committed, Christ-loving, Holy Spirit-filled person could do they order your book but what's something they could do today that they could start a process of making disciples today something from your book yeah i i think it, i think a couple things one um my uh my good friend and, and uh, worship director in our church um, i i do my podcast with her Lori arnold she says it's all the time she says you can make a disciple you've got to get your eyes up and and what we can start doing today is getting our eyes up in the sense of, yes, looking to the Lord, but two is looking around. And, and what Jesus modeled for us is look to see where the Father is working and join Him. And so for us to start thinking about the people that God's put in our lives, that, that, that the Holy Spirit would lead us to have conversations. And, and I tell people this that are starting to engage in disciple making, go be curious about people. Instead of trying to tell them they're wrong and prove them they're wrong, and all, just start asking questions and learning about those that God has put around you. And I, I tell parents this, you know, as I disciple my kids, they're all in college now, but to stay curious about my kids, what, what's God doing in their life? What's God teaching you right now? How are you applying that? And I start asking questions instead of immediately running to answers or telling them what to do. So I think if we get our eyes up and look around and ask the question, God, where are you at work around me? Will you show me? Who, who do you want me to invest in? Who should I spend time with and start going, stepping into that yeah. and developing potential in people around you? And I think that's a place, that's a lifestyle that you can't program that. It's starting for us to become disciple makers is who we are that's what jesus intended for us and for his church that's who we are we are fishers of men yeah yeah and that asking questions and learning about people um also i mean from just a, a psychological perspective people see that as okay you're showing interest true um you're also providing these opportunities for people to um give you i think hints at where they are in terms of their maturity you know, the gentleman I mentioned, uh, I've been trying to connect with, I, I know he goes to church. 
uh, but through conversations we've had, um, I know he thinks a lot about the music, and, and the music may not be to his liking, and um, I, I know he's not serving in church, um, so I, I identify him as a consumer. This isn't to judge. I mean, he could certainly come at me and say, hey, well, you sit alone a lot, too, and um, but how does spiritual maturity play into this, this idea that we all are at one place at one time with the Lord? I mean, all that are at one, at one place at, at, at a time with the Lord as individuals. But how does spiritual maturity play into making disciples? Well, I, I think whenever it, when we look at Scripture, when people come to Christ very, very early on in their walk, um, we see examples of where they immediately begin sharing as well. I think the process of disciple making, if, if I'm if I'm the disciple maker um, and, and I'm investing in somebody that's brand new in the Lord, there's things that God absolutely can use in them to advance the advance the kingdom through disciple making. Some of the, your greatest evangelists are brand new believers, and so I think spiritual maturity plays a part in them being able to, the, the disciple doing what, um, kind of what their level of maturity is. And so as they're growing, you know, I'm not going to have a new believer stand up on a pulpit and teach, you know, uh, teach the Bible. Right. right. But, but I can have them maybe go with me. I take, I'll take them with me, go with me to go visit and pray with somebody in the hospital. Mm. I may, you know, I may have them, uh, uh, serve somebody in our small group together. Uh, you know, there's things that we can start to do in a spiritual, as people become more spiritually mature, we give them more responsibility, more things to do. Um, and that's all done in a relational context. We look at what Jesus did with his disciples. He spent time with them and eventually then he sent them out. They went out, shared the gospel, spent time in people's homes, did all this. They came back and he debriefed with them. Um, we see that, and as they grew, grew, they were given more and more spiritual responsibility. So I think it plays a huge part. Yeah. But again, it, it comes back to none of that happens if I'm not willing to be intentional in my life with the person that I'm discipling. Yeah, but, and uh, teach him. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we've got about two minutes left with uh, Brandon Gwynn, that he's author of a new book um, called Intentional Living Out the Eight Principles of Disciple Making. I count him as a friend and a mentor and, and someone who's um, in, a, in a formal sense, uh, in a process, helped me become a better disciple maker through a pastoral residency program. Let me ask you a sort of a closing question here, and it's for pastors. We are blessed right now, Brian, to have a number of really great pra- pastors listening to us. What is great. the key to a church becoming um, a church that, that sends people out, um, an intentional um, disciple-making church, or as I, I was taught through you, J.D. Greer, uh, winning by losing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the first thing, and, and, and speaking directly to all of my, my brothers, my family, and all of us that are pastoring people um, out there, is, is this. It starts with you. To, to go, you know, I've had so many pastors, probably thousands over the years, say to me, Brandon, I went to Bible college, I got a degree, uh, I can preach sermons, but I was never a disciple. Okay. I don't want right. to make a disciple. Okay. 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 ヒバビタ。さ、さ、スティーマ。さ、さ。うん。みんなのいる前でさ。うん。俺の名前呼ぶんだよ。聞き、なんてじゃない。君てる。君てるっていうの。キキ。あ、みんなの名前呼ぶのみんな。いや、俺俺だけだよ。うん。呼ばれた時みんなどうするわけ。いや、別にどうしたことないよ。それってやってる時にキキって言うからさ。ああ。なんで呼ぶんだろうね。いやみんなあれ数日してるのね。椅子に座ってるからさ。ああ。ああ、どうだか動き始めるのそして。
いい,いい人じゃないそしたら<笑>応援してんだよお父さんのことなるべくあの体を動かさないといけないから年取るとさあーそうだよね。お父さんには挨拶しない。知らん。うん、こっちの方が綺麗かね、設備は。じゃあ,あのスティーム入ったの今日。スティーム入った。あ,あれはあのスティームもう直したのそれともまだ。直して、直してるんじゃない。ああ、じゃあ今日動いてた。よかったね
sometimes there's a lot of pastors. Uh, and there are religions of all sorts. I, this is, I, I think I said this to Brandon. If I didn't, I'll say it now. You are making disciples of something. Uh, you might make disciples of wrestling or football. You might make disciples of business. You might make disciples of real estate. Uh, you might make disciples of, of sexuality. You're making disciples. Uh, the question is, of what? Because you are definitely, if you have any influence, you're making disciples. You could be making disciples of agnosticism. And those people go out and they share the, the gospel of agnosticism. Everybody, to some degree, has a need, of course, for religion because it's encoded into us by God. We, we seek it because it's part of who we are. Sometimes people just, they plug into the wrong thing. It is an amazing thing to watch. The religion of the moment take over the Democrat Party and, and people of the left and to push the political winds to such a point that it is suddenly, all of a sudden, it is liberals who are very literally killing the whales. Endangered whales washed up on New York and New Jersey beaches. Activity related to offshore wind energy farms such as surveying could be a factor. Federal environmentalists confirm 23 dead whales have washed up on the East Coast shore since December. When we see this, I, I get letters from listeners uh, to my podcast who will send me notes saying, please, 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 we need your help in New Jersey. Uh, we're finding these dead whales. It is heartbreaking. And it, it is now conservatives who are, incidentally, I don't think it's going out with the intent to save whales. I think the intent is to say, are you kidding me with these wind farms? Uh, they cannot, the, the, the amazing thing about wind farms is, wind farms don't have enough power to make themselves. Here's what I mean by this. Wind is such a bad form of energy that it isn't powerful enough or consistent enough to build wind tools. So you can't use a wind farm to build the propellers in wind farms. <laughs> you have to use coal uh, or electric, which is often, electric often is coal, to actually make this stuff. It can't even replicate itself. It's that weak a form of energy. And yet we see the, the solar farms are destroying birds. They're baking birds in the air or destroying their navigational abilities. The wind farms are, appear to be destroying whales, which have been sacrosanct to this point. Every form of energy, Every form of energy, energy has the capacity to be deadly because it's energy. But it is incredible to see the religion at the moment, and the religion at the moment is the weather. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. No, I meant climate change. It's all a dodge. It's all it's all a form of, of what would I say, casual paganism. It's worshiping the creation rather than the creator. The Rock instead of The Rock, if you know what I mean. Not the actor. <laughs> no, I mean The Rock of the Word of God. I should stop my babbling. I should stop my babbling and remind you that on this program, we honor God's decision to kind of like the Tower of Babel. Take people who consider themselves wise and stack them atop high towers of sand. And in doing that, give ourselves an opportunity to honor them with the Tower of Babylon. See what we did there? You know about the biblical truth of the Tower of Babel. A Disciple's View presents... Who doesn't love like yellow swords? Trans women are women, trans men are men, and no binary people are the binary. If the prosecutor is not fired, you're not getting the money. The Tower of Babylon. You don't get to do this, Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> to come out uh, with a statement like this and add to it dot 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 but I want to fund this government. You know what happened last night? Set a new record on the border. 10,000 people. That's all that we know. There's probably more. Came across that border. We have a crisis here. President continues to 
population is just not people coming from South America, but coming from 160 other countries. CNN reported last week that there was an individual who came from across that had ties to ISIS. I have asked the White House for a classified briefing for all of Congress. They have not provided that. And so what I'm going to do is fund their government. That those things don't go together. It sounds like Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. Remember that on Sesame Street? I should not sing that. I should get that. I used to play that on my uh, Seattle radio show a lot. Contrast and compare. Consistency is the hobgoblin of a little mind. Nope. Nope, it's pattern recognition. Kevin, you just said this government is allowing ISIS terrorists to cross the border. And then you said, so we'll fund it. Pick a lane. You only have the power of the purse. That is what you were given by our founders. Pick a lane, Kevin. You're okay with terrorists coming into the country or you're not? Pick a lane. Two more stories in the Tower of Babylon. Usually we do three stories. The other day we did one big long one. Oh, there's this about our 51st state. We discovered the U.S. government's buying seeds and fertilizer for Ukrainian farmers and covering the salaries of Ukraine's first responders. It's not just the first responders. We're also covering the pensions of their bureaucrats. We have been funding them to the tune of $1 trillion in 20 years. This isn't just a war effort. This isn't just a, a, a fight the Russians. This has been an ongoing decision to flood that country with money we borrow from China. Just follow the cash flow. And, and, and we don't just borrow it from China, we print it. So one way or the other, we have mass inflation or we're borrowing money from a country that does not, that, that the bosses of which don't mean as well. Just follow the cash flow. Borrow money from a country the government of which intends to destroy us, pay them interest, and then give that money to a corrupt government that is shutting down churches and opposition parties and installing a woman who appears to be a Satanist, a Luciferian, to rebuild the schools and is installing gender ideology and give them money. It's babbling. And to pretend that this is just a war effort, we don't do that here. We try not to pretend. We try very hard not to pretend. Last up in the Tower of Babel, and I'm certain that AOC will make many, many appearances here. She's asked about uh, when she was told everybody she was going to buy a union-made electric vehicle. You were quoted back in July saying you look forward to buying a union-made electric vehicle. But you buy, but you currently have a non-union-made Tesla. UAW already makes some electric vehicles. Yes. Why wasn't that? Is it a problem with the the quality? Is it a problem with the style? Is the market just not there? Uh, no, the, our car was purchased uh, during the pandemic when travel mass, before a, a vaccine had come out. So travel between New York and Washington, the safest way that we had determined was an EV, but that was prior to um, some of the new models coming out on the market that had the range available. Uh, but we're actually looking into trading in our car now. So we're looking into it and hopefully we will soon. Oh, this reminds me of a congresswoman um, who sat and bragged about um, the, 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 you know, purchasing her electric vehicle and, and, and how it was all worth it. And then someone pointed out, you get a transportation budget. Uh, you get a stipend for that. You don't pay to charge it. And you're probably able to use some of that stipend to pay for it. And the American people don't get those stipends. Or those travel budgets, unless you are traveling as an executive. Those are the three stories in the Tower Babbling. You ever um, lock into your minds images of your little ones? You ever do that? That, that sometimes you're drawn back to them? Um, because we went through scary times with our teen daughter. Sometimes I draw back to this image of her in her bed uh, before the troubles came where she was so safe and so secure in her mind that, that nothing could possibly harm her. And of course, I mourn for the fact that something did. 
and I thank God for helping deliver her from the mental effects of that to a large degree. There's mental images I have locked in my mind of, of her in moments of pure joy. Or this, there is a picture I have of her and she's on my shoulders. And I remember it well, I remember it well. Uh, we were hiking up a mountain in Utah. There's actually a cave at the top of a mountain that's around, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of in the Provo area. It's pretty famous down there. It's, it's one of those intense cave structures. If you go inside, you could get lost and die. It's really huge. Uh, as a lake can say, it's incredible. And it's a long hike up and I was hiking with my brothers-in-law. Therefore, I refused to lose the hike. I, I will make it up first. And I offered to carry my daughter, who was about three years old at the time. And she, I said, it will be a hard hike. You can do it, but it will be a hard hike. And I can also carry you. So I chose to carry her. She chose for me to carry her. And she fell asleep instantly in the hot Utah sun. So I think it was at least, least three miles up. And I made sure to beat everybody by a long stretch. We got up there. She was still asleep on my shoulders. And then my um, beloved sister-in-law arrived and began talking to me. And my daughter shifted and woke up. And, and my beloved sister-in-law said, hi, honey. And my daughter, from on her throne, on top of my shoulder, said, that was not a hard walk. <laughs> Always, always anxious to be the naysayer. Well, I ran into this video, and this is where sometimes social media is actually magic. It's a little girl who loves bugs. Hi. Hi. She's looking down at them and saying, Introduce it. herself to the bugs and there is in my daughter maybe this is similar to yours god has placed in my daughter's heart an absolute love for animals and when we moved to idaho uh, from the separate country of washington and the separate universe of seattle she knew better but she had to ask uh it was a massive snowstorm and a big male moose huge came down the hill and was in the in our back property uh, and within probably 10 feet of her windows and my daughter was at time 14 she knew better she had to ask she said dad can i go touch it i need to touch it. i need to pet it i've heard that from her her whole life god does give people unique ways of love and for my daughter it's the innocence of animals because she was innocent before she was harmed. This is the disciples view. I'm Todd Herman. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And we speak because we believe and may God be with you and your family. expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. 90.5 KTXG Greenville, Dallas. Blogging. Hashing it out. Expression. Let's talk. The Stand, a blog for religious freedom, to promote Christian values and to expose attacks on the American family. The Stand is a wall of defense and a beacon of light to those in danger. Lift your voice. Visit afa.net slash the stand. That's afa.net slash the stand. This is American Family Radio, a listener-supported ministry of the American Family Association. Senator Bob Menendez has appeared in a federal court with his wife. They're charged with accepting bribes and providing information to the government of Egypt. 
Jessica Rosenthal has more. New Jersey Democratic Senator Bob Menendez is charged with conspiracy to commit bribery, honest services fraud, and extortion. His wife, Nadine, faces the same charges. They both pleaded not guilty in federal court and were released on bond. Federal prosecutors say they found bribes in the forms of gold bars, cash, and a Mercedes in the senator's home. Menendez and his wife are accused of helping a New Jersey resident originally from Egypt keep his status as the sole provider of halal-certified meats from the U.S. to 